a wonderful singing this morning. Uh, that's certainly something, uh, I believe this is on. It was on. Okay. I don't know if I'm coming through, guys. Okay, got it. Good. Well, that was wonderful singing and uh, something that was missed uh, a lot over the last couple of years. And uh, so it's always wonderful to hear the saints sing. In a couple of weeks, I'll be with uh, 4,500 pastors filling into an auditorium. And uh, you haven't heard anything till you've heard 4,500 pastors sing hymns like that uh, at full volume. And they literally lift the roof off the place. And so that's always an encouragement as well. Well, this morning, I just want to do a one of since I'm on my way to the U.S., and something that's been on my heart for quite some time. And uh, there's always so much a pastor wants to preach, but there's only so much time in which to preach it. And uh, so you can't tackle every topic and every subject and every passage as much as you might like to do that. But uh, I thought since uh, this is a one of, I would take this opportunity to do an introduction on the whole issue of biblical fellowship. And uh, I think we'll see why this is important. And this is just an introduction. It's not meant to be exhaustive. You could do a whole series on this. And, and certainly, uh, I know I've sat at Grace Community Church and heard MacArthur do this and take several weeks and go through the whole issue and topic of fellowship to show its importance and its practical ramifications and the necessity of it. But let me just introduce it this morning. And by way of doing that, I think we could begin this morning just by reading from a portion of Scripture out of 1 John. So if you would take your copy of God's Word this morning and turn to 1 John chapter 1, certainly one of the themes and highlights that John underscores in this first chapter of this little epistle is the whole notion or idea of biblical fellowship. So let me begin reading in verse 1 of 1 John and just read down through the end of this chapter in verse 10. John begins in verse 1, What was from the beginning, what we have heard, and what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested, and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, We are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Let's pray again. Father, again, we just commit your word this morning to our hearts and to our lives And we pray that as we try to unfold the the wonders of what biblical fellowship is and what our responsibilities are as believers in Christ, that you will challenge us and encourage us and spur us on in this area that you might be glorified and that our testimony might remain true. And so, Father, we commit this to you now. Guide our understanding and appropriation of these truths and principles And we pray it all in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, it has been said that fellowship is two fellows on a ship. Now, is that really an accurate assessment 
and evaluation of biblical fellowship. It was also the poet Don A. who said, No man is an island unto himself. Now, given that God has made us to be social creatures in community with one another, the poet certainly got it right on that front. Now, not only are believers in Christ saved to worship and to serve, but we're also saved to be in fellowship with one another. So what follows this morning is just a brief introduction to the kind of fellowship that we find outlined in Paul's epistles because it's primarily the Apostle Paul who really dealt with the topic and the issue of biblical fellowship. It will be quickly discerned that biblical fellowship is more than just sharing pleasantries and niceties around a cup of tea, as nice as that might be. Fellowship is more than shaking hands at the door on your way out of the morning service. It's more than talking about the weather or current affairs on the way to the car. Nothing wrong with those things, but that is not necessarily biblical fellowship. Biblical fellowship is more than a fellowship tea. It's more than a picnic. It's, it's more than a bribe although it can, that, that can serve as an inducement to biblical fellowship. The following quote from a book written some 50 years ago well illustrates the necessity of biblical fellowship, which traces its roots back to the moment of creation and the creation of man. Bruce Larson, who wrote the book Dare to Live, said this, the neighborhood bar is possibly the best counterfeit there is to the fellowship Christ wants to give his church. It's an imitation, dispensing liquor instead of grace, escaping, uh, escape rather than reality, but it is permissive, accepted, and inclusive fellowship. It is unshockable. It is democratic. You can tell people secrets and they usually don't tell others or want to. The bar flourishes not because most people are alcoholics, but because God has put in the human heart the desire to know and be known, to love and be loved. And so many seek a counterfeit at the price of a few beers. End quote. That said, it's important to unpack, then, the nature of true biblical fellowship so we can strive to better understand it and then seek to promote it not only in our own individual lives but in our church life as well. For that reason, I want to share five components this morning of biblical fellowship as outlined in Scripture that will enable us to better understand and then seek to apply these truths to our lives. And so this morning, we'll briefly look at the essence of fellowship, the elevation of fellowship, the evidence of fellowship, the enemies of fellowship, and then finally conclude with the practical expressions of fellowship. So let's begin with the foundation of it all, the essence of fellowship. That is to say, the context of fellowship. What is it? Where does it come from? What did it look like in ancient society? Well, the secular understanding of fellowship, which comes from the Greek word uh, koinonia, Maybe you've heard it pronounced koinonia. It's actually koinonia. The term koinonia in ancient Greek civilization primarily meant partnership. It spoke of community. And as the ancient Greeks applied it to the gods and goddesses, it was a term that was used to speak of unbroken fellowship between the gods and man. In some instances, the Greeks used it 
for the very institution of marriage itself because it indicates such a high degree of intimacy and close association. That's certainly a good illustration of what koinonia is. By the time we look at the Old Testament, the Old Testament doesn't have a direct corollary to this, but it certainly sets the background for our New Testament understanding of the very need for koinonia or fellowship. Because what we see in Genesis 3, through the fall of Adam and Eve, and thereby all of mankind, which is included in that fall, what we see there is a rupture of fellowship, first on the vertical plane between God and man, and then ruptured fellowship between that primeval couple, Adam and Eve. This was immediately followed by a loss of unity among men. Note the blame game that took place in Genesis 3. The woman whom thou gave, us, gave me, ah, the serpent did it, and so forth. Is it all unraveled? But because it is not good for man to be alone, God in his sovereign plan decreed and reached out and made a way for forgiveness and restoration first to himself and then to those around us. So when sin enters into the equation, it becomes impossible to maintain any kind of practical unity and the fellowship that would flow from that. But repentance and, of course, salvation in Christ brings restoration first vertically and then horizontally on the human plane. By the time we get to the New Testament context for fellowship, we see Paul making use of this term koinonia many times. But he uses it strictly in a spiritual sense. In relationship to individuals who help make up the local expression of a church. The ecclesia, the called out one. And he anchors his understanding of fellowship first and foremost in being rightly related to Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 1, 9, and I'll come back to this momentarily, he talks about the fellowship that the Corinthians have been called to the fellowship of his Son. So once we're brought into union and fellowship with Jesus Christ through the new birth, we're automatically, by default, brought into union and fellowship with one another. Paul talks about the fellowship of the Holy Spirit in 2 Corinthians 13, 14. He talks about the fellowship of the gospel in Philippians 1, 5. In Philemon 6, he talks about the fellowship of the faith. And in Galatians 2.9, he talks about the right hand of fellowship, which is much better than the left foot of fellowship. So what is the biblical understanding, the biblical definition of fellowship? First, I'll give you my definition, and then a couple of other definitions. I've defined it this way. Fellowship is joint participation, intimacy, generosity, and close association in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Further, it has been defined this way, participation in the body and blood of Christ, and union with the exalted Christ on the basis of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. No stranger to the topic, John MacArthur words it this way. The basis is found in the word koinonia, which suggests sharing and communion, a common ground. Thus, believers have a common ground, a partnership with something to share. These are all like-minded definitions, but you get the idea. Community, partnership, 
close association. All of that is included in the understanding and definition of New Testament fellowship. Therefore, it's in stark contrast to fraternity. There's a distinction between biblical fellowship and secular fraternity. Fraternity is something that clubs have and teams have. But biblical fellowship goes much deeper and is first and foremost anchored in a relationship with Jesus Christ. And this gives rise to the human partnership and community with other like-minded believers who then demonstrate their positional unity that Paul talks about in the book of Ephesians as they all share and practicing the 35 one another's that Paul talks about in his epistles. So that's the essence of fellowship. What about the elevation of fellowship? In other words, the grounding of it. Well, the grounding of it is found in heaven, of course. But let's just look at a couple of passages. The first one being 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And I'm, I'll leave the, there are many passages we could look at, but I'll only look at a few this morning for the sake of time and for the sake of overworking your fingers this morning. But 1 Corinthians, in his introduction, in chapter 1 and verse 9, Paul addresses them, and he says in verse 9 there, God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So, the necessary first cause of fellowship, as we've already alluded to, is found in Christ. It's found in the new birth. It's found in being born from above. There is a vertical necessity for the horizontal imperative to take place. Again, at the end of 2 Corinthians now, turn over a few pages, in his benediction there, in 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 14, Paul concludes that epistle with these words. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So we're brought into fellowship with God. That leads to further fellowship in the here and in the now that can practically be demonstrated to one another. One more passage, Philippians. Philippians chapter 1, turn over a few pages from 2 Corinthians 13 to Philippians 1 and verse 5. In his opening introduction to the Philippian church, Paul says these words in verse 5. In view of your participation or fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. So Paul is highlighting the importance of that vertical relationship. That's the starting line. That's the premise for all of this. And the reason why he does that is because, remember, we've already mentioned the Garden of Eden and the loss of fellowship both with God and with man that took place in that moment after the fall. And so there was disunity. There was estrangement between man and God and estrangement between uh, Adam and Eve. Yet God's sovereign plan included building a bridge through his covenant to Abraham, then to Moses and ancient Israel, and it all culminates and crescendos in the birth of his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. And because of that grand foundation, that grounding, there is a new birth that is available which serves as the basis of entrance into this new existence which is expressed in contrast to a former way of life. 
This leads to fellowship. And so there is an elevation in our fellowship. Again, 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1, verses 3, 6, and 7 there, we see fellowship with Christ is again highlighted. Verse 3, what we have seen, what we have heard, we proclaim to you also so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. You see that Trinitarian fellowship by virtue of the fact that a believer is brought into a right relationship with God, we enjoy fellowship with the triune Godhead. We have access to the fellowship that the triune Godhead has enjoyed for all eternity. Then verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus' his Son cleanses us from all sin. What a wonderful thought. You can be in sin one moment, but if we confess our sins, as verse 9 declares there in 1 John 1, then he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us and to bring us back into a right relationship first with himself and then with those around us. And so this fellowship with Christ includes the apostolic teaching of God's word, obedience or walking in the light, purity through the confession of our daily sins, and being partakers of his shed blood as his righteousness is credited to our account. Again, MacArthur rightly notes, no member properly functions detached from the rest of the body. Just as a person's lungs can't be removed and still be expected to keep a person breathing. In other words, Christianity is not a spectator sport. It's not an individual sport. It's not about the loneliness of the long-distance runner. We're brought into community. We're meant to be in a community, in a physical location, in close proximity. Okay, maybe now with a little bit of social distancing. But we're brought into a close community with one another and we're meant to interact and associate with one another beyond social media platforms. The spiritual significance then of this fellowship, the elevation of this fellowship, means among other things that we live with Christ, Romans 6, 8, we suffer with Christ, Romans 8, 17. We're crucified with Christ, Romans 6, 6. We are raised with Christ, Colossians 2, 12 and 3, 1. And we will be glorified with him, Romans 8, 19. It can be concluded then that when there is an absence or a defect in horizontal fellowship, it can be directly tied to a faulty vertical relationship with God. And so it's important to understand the elevation or the vertical necessity of fellowship. Thirdly, a third component of this is the evidence of fellowship. What does horizontal fellowship practically look like? What are the general truths that govern this? Well, please turn with me in your Bibles back to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. Acts 2 verse 42. Most of you know it fairly well. The birth of the the new church, 3,000 souls added under the church in one day, 
So what did they do? What were the non-negotiables? What were the fundamentals that they followed? Verse 42. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Verse 44. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. Verse 46. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. So what are they doing? They're meeting together. They're seeking togetherness with those of like precious faith. And that is evidenced. It's evidenced through sound teaching. That was the primary reason they got together. And afterwards, many times, they would share a meal together. And so the purpose was to gather around the teaching of the Word of God. This led to close and lasting relationships because of the significant amount of time that they spent together. And so they worshiped together, they broke bread together, they prayed together, they encouraged one another together in the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. Now think of the context here. Over 3,000 souls added to the church in one day. From a pastoral perspective, I stand back and say, whoa, how do you deal with that? They're all from different places, different backgrounds. It's the time of Pentecost. You have different personalities, different giftedness, different languages represented together. And it wasn't too long after this that Gentiles were soon thrown into the mix. Then you had former Jews who had to fellowship with their once despised enemies, the Gentiles. So former enemies were now friends and all part of the same spiritual family. That could spell the recipe for disaster. But this is what they did. This was groundbreaking stuff. And so they evidenced their fellowship by gathering together for sound teaching, to pray, and for the breaking of bread for communion. Because communion, the Lord's table, is an ordinance of the church. It's not something that we irrigate to ourselves in our own homes. It's something that's meant for the church. It's something that is to be led by the church of Jesus Christ. Just as we don't baptize ourselves, we don't take it upon ourselves to break communion bread by ourselves. We do it as the body of Christ. So what are the implications then of Acts 2.42? Congregating, frequently assembling together, associating, having and sharing meals together, The New Testament idea of hospitality flows directly out of this idea. And then communicating, talking with one another, with more than superficial pleasantries. Let me ask you this morning, how much do you know about those around you this morning? How great it would be if everyone would step out of their comfort zones and got to know a couple of people in the church that they didn't know before over the course of the next few months. There was also participation. They were participating, getting involved in one another's lives. To do that, you have to drop your guard. There has to be a certain level of transparency. There was reciprocation. Fellowship was more than a one-way street. It's more than the pastor's job. It's everyone's job. It isn't only leadership that reaches out and seeks to fellowship. It's everybody in the congregation. Extending hospitality to those around you 
even to the leadership itself. That's all part and parcel. That's how Acts 2, 42 and to the end of the chapter was demonstrated in the early church. So it was, it was evidenced in sound teaching. It's also evidenced in sacrificial generosity. Look over at chapter 4 of Acts, verse 32. Sacrificial generosity. In Acts 4 and verse 32, we read these words. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were in common property to them. There was the communal sharing of goods and wealth and money and to meet physical and temporal needs of others. Now we need to be careful here to understand what promoted this. What's the catalyst for this? It arises out of the gospel that unites both Jew and Gentile alike. And remember, many who came to Christ on the day of Pentecost were diaspora Jews from other regions of the Roman Empire, and they remained in Jerusalem for instruction and fellowship before going back home. And so they had tangible needs, and those who were residents there in Jerusalem helped to meet those tangible needs. Let me just say this as an interesting footnote. There is absolutely no hint of the worldly, secular notion of communism here. There are many who hijack passages like this to promote Marxism in the church. They're doing it today under the guise of social justice. They did it before in this country through liberation theology, which is nothing more than Marxism with a clerical collar. The generosity that took place here was organic and it was spontaneous. It was not organized. It was not rooted in economic and political theory. And the very fact of the mention of Mary's house in Acts 12.12 12 indicates that private ownership continued on as did the laws regarding stealing another man's property. So you're not going to be able to prove das Kapital from Acts 4.32. Try again. Think of the collections that Paul brought to the church at Jerusalem from those who had given around the Gentile world at that time, including Macedonia. This was a tangible expression of fellowship of the churches that arose out of the gospel. So there's evidence of sacrificial generosity. It's also evidence in avoiding unholy alliances. You can turn over to 2 Corinthians 6, beginning in verse 14. I think we know it well in this church. But Paul says there in 2 Corinthians 6, 14, do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness? So we, un we avoid these unholy alliances of whatever sort. And he doesn't have any one thing in mind here. It could be any number of things. And so we must make sure that our fellowship is with God, with, through Christ first and foremost, and then with one another. And so this, these are just some of the ways in which fellowship is evidenced. What about the enemies of fellowship, though? What are the hindrances to fellowship? Well, they're diverse and many, and I'll just mention a few this morning very quickly. But just to give you an idea, and you can fill in the blanks and think of some more, I'm sure, on your own. But one of the enemies of fellowship is the tyranny of the urgent. Being too busy. Cluttered lives that oftentimes lead to superficial relationships. 
And I understand, in this day and age, everything moves so quickly. The click of a mouse, the blink of an eye. It's hard not to overcommit. And I speak of one who is guilty of that. Those in the ministry have a, a glaring fault. We tend to overcommit ourselves. And sometimes you have to take a step back and take inventory and reprioritize your life. And at the end of the day, we, we really schedule what's important to us. That's why we have to constantly take stock and reprioritize. So the tyranny of urgent is certainly one of the hindrances of fellowship. What about the fear of man? Afraid to reach out and open up to others and to drop our guard and remove the mask. To be transparent and real. Remove the self-protective barriers that serve as an obstacle to deep, authentic fellowship. The Berlin Wall of our lives must be torn down. And of course this exposes us. It makes us more vulnerable. Such is the trauma of transparency, but it is needful. Believe it or not, I used to be painfully shy. And when the Lord called me to ministry, I realized, son, you're going to have to step out of yourself. You're going to have to make the first move many times. You're going to have to step outside of the comfort zone and take a chance and risk. God has given grace to do that. I mean, I probably will never win uh, any congeniality awards. But the point is that, that I had to step out of myself, and I still have to force myself to do that on occasion. What about personal agendas? Self-promotion, which uses other people and seeks to get to know others with ulterior motives in mind. Like the businessman who goes to church so he can pass out his business cards. That's not to say that we can't do business with one another. I'm not saying that. But when that's the motive, when that's what's driving your church attendance, there's something wrong. Misplaced priorities. What about unprecedented mobility? We have modern day transport to get to church, but we also have modern day transport to go other places other than church. And that can become problematic if it becomes a habit. What about an anemic view of the church? One of the greatest weaknesses today in the church at large is that neither pastors nor those that they minister to really have a solid understanding of what the church is. In theological terms, we call this ecclesiology. There's a weak, anemic ecclesiology at play today as the church at large begins to incorporate more aspects of the world and the culture around us. one other. It's eminently practical. Dare I say it? COVID. The last two years have impeded biblical fellowship. And while live stream and social media allowed us to loosely stay in touch and try to minister at least on some level, Live stream and social media should never, ever become a replacement for being physically present in God's body, the local church. In a recent Q&A, MacArthur was asked about live stream. His response was off the cuff and immediate. Of course, it trended and There's been a lot of buzz about this and a lot of criticism, but the first words out of his mouth were, live stream is TV, not fellowship. 
Now, having said that, I understand where he's coming from. He's not throwing the baby out with the bathwater because Grace Community Church does have a live stream, both in their morning and evening services. And that is to minister to those who are sick, those who are shut-ins, those who are traveling, and those who can't be there for whatever reasons. But it's meant to be a stopgap, not a replacement. Just think of it. If you haven't been to church for over two years now, that means you haven't partaken of the Lord's table in two years. If that doesn't bother you, it should. It's an ordinance of the church. It's something we're to do on a regular basis. It's something that's meant to be done in the presence of community of other like-minded believers. Look, if you can go to the grocery store and you can sit there and sip coffee at Mug and Bean, you can be in church. This location is much safer than most of the secular locations around us. It's cleaned on a weekly basis. Most of us are much more conscientious than many people in the world so that if we have a sniffle or a cough or we don't feel right, we don't come to church. That's when we avail ourselves to live stream. So I'm not throwing the baby out with the bathwater, but simply issuing the admonishment and the encouragement here. These are just some of the hindrances to fellowship then what's the expression of fellowship? And I'll close with this and do so quickly. In other words, the fruit of fellowship as it's seen in practical service to one another. Now, I'm just going to give you seven of these, but there are 35 one another's. And I'm not going to look up the terms. You can look them up or look up the passages on your own. But in Ephesians 4.32, Paul tells the Ephesians, the believers, to forgive one another. And he does that in the context of do not let the sun set on your anger. Make short work of your disputes. Deal with them quickly. Don't let them fester and metastasize. Deal with it. Forgive one another. Move on. Secondly, bear one another's burdens. Galatians 6.2 something we do all the time here. We pray for people. We call them up when we, when we hear their sickness or illness. and um, We try to minister to those who have lost their jobs or are in want or need of some kind. Maybe not perfectly, but certainly there's an effort. There's a desire to do that, not only on the part of leadership, but on the part of many of you as well who just do it silently behind the scenes. So we bear one another's burdens. How about loving one another? 1 John 4, 7. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. And so we love one another. Practical demonstrations of love. How about encouraging one another? Hebrews 3.13, Hebrews 10.25, in the context of not forsaking the assembling of yourselves as the manner of some is, especially as you see the day of Christ dawning. My friends, if ever we needed to encourage one another, it is here, it is now, it is in a world that is spinning off its access and tending toward chaos and anarchy. We need to encourage one another because the day of Christ is dawning. What about building up one another, edifying one another, spurring one another on, taking a a believer who is not as anchored in faith and discipling them and moving them along? You don't need a charter to do that. You don't need a mandate from leadership to do that. What about admonishing one another? Praying for one another. These are all part and parcel of the one another's. These are practical demonstrations of what biblical fellowship looks like. We could say a lot more, but I think you get the idea this morning. Let me ask you, 
How is your fellowship? How is your vertical fellowship with the Lord? Are some, there's some things you need to sort out there. What about your fellowship, husbands with your wives and wives with your husbands? Parents with your children and children with your parents. It starts with a right relationship with the Lord. What changes do you need to make or amendments to improve the level of fellowship that you have with God and man to make it more meaningful, to make it more biblical? What hindrances need to be addressed before you can advance further in this area? And for those who have not yet come to Christ, fellowship only begins once you've been born again of the incorruptible seed of Jesus Christ. Beloved, the days are evil. The time is short. So let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves as the manner of some is. Let's pray. Father, I, I thank you again for this church. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the encouragement and the admonishment that we get from your word considering biblical fellowship. And if we've learned anything this morning, Lord, it is this, that first and foremost, we are to be rightly related to you. That means that we must repent and we must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, for those of us who already know you, that means that we must confess our daily sin. We must keep a short account and reckoning of the obstacles and the hindrances that would keep us from fellowshipping with you and by default fellowshipping with those around us. Father, help us. Help us to grow in this area. Help us to excel still even more. Help us to step out of ourselves and out of our comfort zones and seek to minister to somebody that we do not know in this church body. Help us to pray for one another more than what we already do and to encourage one another as we see the, the storm clouds arising in the horizon. Father, help us to do this for your honor, for your glory, and for the testimony, our individual testimonies and the testimony of this church. And so, Father, we commit this to you. Enable us where we are weak. Give us wisdom where we are dull. And give us grace where we need it most. And Father, may you be honored and glorified in it all. And we will give you thanks in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Rickard, would you come and close us in our final hymn?